Thank you for your patience. Uh, just before the message, my wife and I have a special in music.
I want to see my Jesus. Amen. He's the one that died for me. He's the one I'm reason, the only reason that I can be there. And uh, I hope that that's your thoughts as well. There are many things that we'll have access to in heaven, many things that we'll get to do, and we'll have plenty of time to do them all. Take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I heard a story of a young man who said that he joined the military so that he could see the world. You know how that is. The world he saw was not what he expected. He was a soldier, not a sightseer. Some Christians got saved so that they could see God's heaven. Hey, I, I just make it to heaven. That'll be okay. I just want to get to heaven. But they didn't realize they signed up to be a soldier of Jesus Christ. That's what being a Christian is. It's not just a free ticket at death to go into God's heaven. But it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has left us here in this world for reason. And that one of the reasons that he's left us here is for us to protect ourselves and to guard ourselves in the spiritual warfare that we find ourselves. Because that's exactly what we sign into when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. We've just started a mini-series, as I said earlier, uh, on the armor of God, we've been studying how to defend ourselves against the temptations of Christ. Every one of us face temptations. The temptations that you face may not be the same as I face, but every one of us face temptations, and every one of us struggle with temptations. And so it is an ongoing situation in which every one of us have to learn how to defend ourselves against the temptations that come and how to defeat uh, our enemy, the devil, how to have victory when he comes in attack through his demons. Uh, we've already seen a proper attitude that we're to have, which is an alert awareness of the devil's presence and of his danger. We've seen some of the proper armor as far as looking at the need that we have for this armor because our enemy is tricky. Our enemy is invisible. It's a spiritual enemy that we fight. And therefore, we need this particular armor. Its purpose, we've seen, to, to make us strong in order to withstand the fiery darts of the devil's temptations and to stand, that is, don't lose ground once we've gained some victory. We are to be strong in the Lord to withstand and to stand. And then we began two weeks ago looking at the pieces. Now, last Sunday was Father's Day. Uh, we paused and had a message for us as uh, fathers, uh, walking with the Lord as we should. But uh, I want to get back into looking at our pieces here. There are six total pieces that God gives us in Ephesians 6. And it is the whole armor of God that we need. You can't just pick and choose which pieces you want. You've got to look at the whole armor that we need, every piece of it. And so we want to learn today, Lord willing, about the breastplate of righteousness. Father, I pray that you'd allow me to both have a freedom of speech, help us not to be distracted by anything around us, help us not to be distracted by any demons in our mind to get us to think about other things, but may we give our whole attention, wholehearted attention to your word this morning. May we understand exactly what it's saying. I pray, I pray that you would help me to convey that in a very clear way. And we thank you for what you accomplished. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. In verse 14, we saw uh, two weeks ago, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. If you remember uh, the belt of truth we looked at, the uh, people of their day, the men of their day, the soldiers, uh, even the warden's tunics, and they had a belt. And that belt had a couple of purposes. One, uh, uh, it could hold uh, their sword it, it, you know, that would be tucked there. It was also used as they could gather up their, their gown, their garment, and tuck it into the belt so that it would be just uh, above their knee, and then they could move more freely to run, to fight, etc. It was a preparedness for battle. 
And so the belt of truth was a preparedness with the truth that it's talking about. That's our belt of truth. We saw that we needed to be prepared with the truth of God's Word. And it's God's Word that is the truth. Uh, this past Wednesday night, I shared with our folks that were there in a devotional study uh, in Psalm 138, verse 2 said, I will worship toward the holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness. There was two things he was going to praise his name for. One was for his loving kindness, that is his mercy, his goodness, his faithfulness to us. And he says, for thy truth. And then he went on to say, For thou hast magnified thy word in the change for truth. <laughs> thou hast magnified thy word above thy name, all thy name. And so God has magnified the truth of his word even above his own name. And it shows us the importance of the truth of God. And so the belt of truth is us being prepared with the truth of God's word. And we learned the three things about the truth. On one, the truth is always more than just facts. You remember about the story I told you of a man who went fishing and then came back and told his wife he caught 20 catfish. And you know how we explained he didn't go catching them this way. The guy at the, meat, uh, the fish market threw him and he caught and he brought home. And, you know, he told the truth. He caught them. But it wasn't the truth, was it? If truth is not just facts, it's not just the words that say, yeah, that is truthful, but it's the what you're trying to communicate. You can say the right words and communicate, but it's not what really happened. And so we need to, to understand that the truth is more than just facts. It includes intent and includes purpose. Second, we saw that truth has already been predetermined by God in advance. God has already determined what is true. We run into people all the time today that, that have the conversation and say, well, you have your truth, I have my truth. Who's to say what truth is right? Well, the answer to that is God. Because it's not my truth. And it's not your truth. The only truth that there is is what God has predetermined is true. And so what God says is true, and either you have the choice to agree with it or to disagree with it. But we don't just come up and make up our own truth. So wherever you're talking with someone and they want to, to try to talk about truth uh, uh, being relative and that there is no absolutes, that's not, uh, that's not your opinion that there are absolutes. It's God's Word that says it. God has established it. And God has given the truth in His Word and that's what we believe is the truth. Not my truth, not your truth, but it's God's truth. And they have a choice then to either to believe it or reject it. So we have there the truth that's always, uh, it's already been predetermined. And third, we saw that what's true of you on the inside needs to be true of you on the outside. Uh, that is, should be so obvious to us. There's too many Christians today that are hypocrites. Uh, what they say they believe, what they say that they stand for, is not what other people see as the truth in their lives. And that should be to our shame. If we have believed the truth of the gospel, that we're genuinely saved, we have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, if we have believed the truth of the gospel, then we must learn the truth of God's Word in order to do the truth of God's Word, to obey that truth in front of others. That's our responsibility, to live out on the outside what we believe is on the inside. So that's what we saw as the belt of truth. Now looking at the breastplate of righteousness in the same verse, we stand having the Lord's Spirit about truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now first of all, what is righteousness? Well, you might break it apart there and understand it's right doing. It's being right. Uh, that is correct there. Being and doing what God says is right. But I want to break it down into those two categories and understand it. The first one of being right in God's eyes. The second one, doing right in front of others. Being right in God's eyes we would call positional righteousness. You know that when I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, 
immediately, not only did God forgive me of all my sins and take out of my account all of my sin and its death that it deserves, but he deposited into my account the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what justification means. Justification, there's two ways of understanding it. One is a real simple, just as if I'd never sinned. He makes me just as if I had never sinned. He takes away all of my sin. But it also means declared righteous. And in the place, as I said, he has deposited the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We're told in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 that he, God, hath made him, Jesus Christ, the one who knew no sin. He's made him to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of Christ in him. And so when I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, God took out of my account all of the sin and all of its uh, uh, payment wages that I was uh, supposed to pay. He placed that upon Jesus Christ. Jesus paid it all. Praise the Lord. And then God deposited into my account the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So when God looks at Randy Blackwell, he doesn't see the sin of Randy Blackwell, but he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And based on that only am I worthy to go to God's heaven. And if you do not have the sins forgiven and the righteousness deposited, you're not on your way to heaven. I don't, I don't care how long you believe something, how long you've stated something, how many times you've been baptized, or how many churches you have membership in, it does not matter a bit because salvation is only when we come to realize that we're lost, that we're headed toward hell. Jesus Christ died in my place to pay for my sin. And when I, by faith, make a choice to receive what He did as my payment of sin, that's when salvation takes place. My sins are forgiven. The righteousness of Christ is deposited. I'm on my way to heaven, and I'm engaged in the warfare that Jesus Christ says I'm a soldier of His. That's what takes place. That's our positional righteousness. Is our justification. Are you justified this morning? Have you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Because that's so important. Um, don't let that slip. Don't let that slide. Make sure you understand. That's our positional righteousness. Secondly, our doing right in front of others. That's our practical righteousness. Now, here's the difference. When I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior in position, I am in Christ. I am baptized by the Holy Spirit. I'm immersed into the body of Jesus Christ. I am His. I am sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. And I am in His hand and in God's hand. And Jesus said, no man will pluck, me out of, uh, pluck you out of my hand. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life. How long is eternal? Well, if it's eternal life, you can't stop, can it? I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And so it is that salvation that He offers unto us that is secure in Him. That's our position. But then there is our practice. Nothing will ever change my position. But my practice changes all the time. I may be living one week. Uh, really committed to the Lord. There's no sin uh, that I'm unaware, I'm aware of in my life. I repented and confessed it. I'm living for the Lord and then uh, doing pretty good. I mean, a little sins here and there. But then there'll be another week in which I fall flat on my face spiritually. And I sin. And I'm out of fellowship with the Lord. And God begins to work on my heart and, and get me back in that relationship and that fellowship. That's my practice. That's every one of us because our practice can be up and down. Our practice is what we can lose grip of if we're not careful. Titus 2 and verses 11 and 12 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us, excuse me, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live, we should behave ourselves soberly, that's sober-mindedly, righteously and godly in this present world. God wants us to live, to behave ourselves righteously and godly in this 
present world. We have that responsibility. That's God's will for your life. And we are to do that by doing what is right in front of others, our practical righteousness before the world. As I mentioned a while ago, though, what is right? Remember the answer. What God says is right. <laughs> this is what is right. So if I'm to live what is right, guess what I've got to do first? I've got to know what it says is right. You can't do what you don't. And so we must know the Word of God. We must learn the Word of God in order to do. That's what the belt of truth uh, comes. While the belt of truth comes first, we must know the truth, have the truth, in order to be able to do the truth. The breastplate of righteousness, doing the right in front of others. Um, God gives that absolute truth for us to know. Also, remember this, that Satan, our enemy, is called the accuser of the brethren. In Revelation chapter 12, it states about the devil being that. And he accuses me before God. He accuses you before God. When we sin, the devil will say, Satan will say, look at there. <coughs> Who's going to pick up? Robbie? I'll pick on you. There's that Robbie Holland. Uh, he don't love you. Look at what he just did today. Look at the, the words that came out of his mouth. Look at him. That's what Satan does. You know, there are demons right here with us, but Satan is not here this morning. He's not going to mess with us, do you? Satan is before God accusing the brother. His demons are right here doing his work, putting thoughts in your mind. Having you count different things on the wall. Uh, all kinds of things just to distract you. Because he doesn't want you to hear what God's word is saying. So we need to recognize he is the accuser of our of the brethren. But understand this. He does not accuse your position. He accuses your practice. There's nothing he can do about our position. Remember? We're sealed. He can't touch us. But it's the practice that he can have influence in. And so it's the practice that he seeks to, to uh, cause us to fall and to ruin our testimony. How? Well, by turning your attention. He wants to turn your attention away from the spiritual realm and get your attention onto the physical realm. To get you focused on the things of this world. How do we focus on the things of this world? There are five of them. We call them our five senses. Inroads into our mind, into our life. What are our five senses? Well, what we see, what we taste, what we smell, what we feel, what we hear. They're the inroads into our life. And Satan seeks to use those things to bring the things of this world to our attention. And to cause us then to think about and to focus on those things of the world. <coughs> if you choose to depend only on your five senses, then you're headed for trouble. For instance, uh, riding motorcycles with shorts and a t-shirt and no helmet may look like it would be fun. And I'm sure that it is for a while until your first accident. And if you live through it, you may be scarred for life. That may look like fun. Cotton candy may taste terrific, but a steady diet of it is going to ruin your health. A popular song might have a great tune to listen to, but listening to its bad words and worldly message over and over again is a terrible thing for your mind. You know, Scripture, God tells us that we are to renew our mind with God's Word. But I find that the devil through his demons try to get us to renew our mind on a lot of other things in the world, whether it's through movies and TVs or music or 
other people. There are things that he wants to put up in our minds and get us to think about that will cause us a downfall. Understand that Satan will use as much as he can in this physical world coming in through our five senses to keep us down. That's why God warned us in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. My love for the Father has been diminished if I love the world. It affects me. He goes on to say, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world, and the world passes away. It will not last, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. God warns us about the Satan's ploy to get us to focus on the things of the world by putting those things into our mind because as we begin to think about those things, we begin to desire those things and before long, we find us right in the middle of it. Paul spoke of a young man that had followed him to serve the Lord. His name was Demas. Second Timothy 4.10, Paul said that Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. I don't know exactly what his sin was. I don't know exactly how he tripped up and decided he didn't want to follow the Lord anymore by serving with Paul. But something tied to this world got his attention. Something tied to this world tugged at his heart more than God. And he left off serving God and he went after the things of the world. When we neglect practical righteousness in our life, we open ourselves up to Satan's attacks. His snares that he sets to entrap us. He wants you defeated. Because if you're defeated, you'll never amount to much for God. We need to guard ourselves. Satan's accusations, Satan's attacks. Now, I want you to know this with the this breastplate of righteousness. God indicates specifically the area area of righteousness that we're guarding. It's the breastplate. Uh, the soldier's breastplate went from the neck until their waist. It would guard what we call the vitals. It's kind of like a police officer's bulletproof vest. Same idea, same function. In the vitals, you have, first of all, the heart. That's a biggie. We want to guard our heart because if Satan affects our heart, he has us. We're told in Proverbs 4.23, keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. We're to guard our heart. Put everything into guarding that particular function. What is the heart? Symbolically, the heart represents the mind. Proverbs 23, 7, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. The way that we think, that's why I said a while ago, Satan wants to come in and to get your mind to think about the things of the world. He wants to use your senses as inroads to channel your thoughts into those areas because as you start to think about something in the world, you begin to desire. <coughs> Excuse me. The more, I'll do this. The more you desire it, the more it becomes that second nature that you want it. You are going to have it. You make the choices then to follow. Uh, 
So in the breastplate of righteousness, this area that we're guarding, our heart, first of all, symbolically represents the mind that we're to protect, we're to maintain righteous thinking, guard ourselves from any of the inroads that Satan wants to come in and affect our mind. Secondly, the other area is called what we call the bowels, the functional organs uh, of our body. Uh, symbolically, they represent our feelings and emotions. Have you ever uh, been nervous to do something, maybe in front of other people, sing a solo or something of that nature? And uh, as you got up to, to speak there, you just felt like you had these what we call butterflies in our gut. <laughs> uh, that's what it's talking about, that area of feeling, that area of emotions that are there. And so we have this uh, um, um, to be protected in our feelings and our emotions. First John 3, 17 speaks of shutting up the bowels of compassion, uh, your feelings of compassion, of love toward another individual. Uh, Satan wants to confuse your emotions, to confuse your feelings by corrupting your desire. That is, what you focus on, you begin to think about, remember? And what you think about, you begin to desire. So he wants to confuse your emotions by corrupting your desires so that he can draw your affections toward the things of this earth. That's his process. It's not a difficult plan to understand. But it's the way that Satan works. And we've got then to identify the areas of our life, how Satan is using some of that to cause us to think about and to desire and therefore to influence our affections toward things that are just temporary in this life and not those things that are eternal. That's why we read in Colossians 3, 2, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. Set your affections on things where it's going to last for eternity, not on the things that's going to pass away here shortly. The breastplate of righteousness is to protect your thoughts and your affections. So with that in mind, I want you to think with me in the next few moments. Close your eyes. Just think about you. As your head's bowed and you're thinking, I want you to listen carefully. Our, our instrument's going to play, play silently in just a moment. Every Christian is in a spiritual warfare seeking to defend against temptations and to defeat our enemy, the devil. Every Christian. Now, can I ask you first, are you in that group? Do you know that you're a Christian? I'm not talking about that you were born in a Christian nation. I'm not talking about that you've gone to church, you have a membership. But have you come to a point in your life that you realize that you were a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for your sin in your place, and you have made a choice to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Salvation just does not automatically happen. And the scripture in, in the book of James tells us that the demons also believe and tremble. They're not saved. Just believing in God, believing that Jesus died on the cross and rose again, they are facts of history. But salvation is a relationship. It's not a religion. It is a personal relationship that comes to be when we make a choice to receive Jesus Christ as Savior. Have you made that choice? If you can say with me today, Pastor, I am sure I have already made that choice. Could I see your hand lifted up right now? I have made that choice. I know that I have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Thank you. You may put them down. There were some that could not raise their hand, honestly. May I say to you just a moment here, if you do not know for sure that you made that choice, why not make it today? Why not let this be the day? Don't let the devil tell you, just walk out, you can think about it, you can do it later. None of us are guaranteed a later. The 
Today is the day of salvation, the scripture says. Won't you make that choice right now? And then for every one of us, every Christian, every genuine believer, we're in a spiritual warfare. We all need the armor. We all need every part of the armor. But we will never use the armor if we don't first know what that armor is. The belt of truth, readiness with the truth of God's word, knowing it and doing it. The breastplate of righteousness, being righteous in position that is saved and being righteous in practice, in your behavior. But Satan, does Satan have some of you snared? <clears throat> Are there things right now that God has brought to your mind and said, hey, you need to deal with this? Why not deal with it right now? Repent, turn from it. Honestly, admit it to the Lord what you've done. He says he's faithful and uh, willing to forgive us of any sin if we will repent and confess it genuinely. Don't let Satan win the battle of your mind and emotions. Guard what you let influence you. Feed often on the Word of God, the truth, and seek to live it for others. Father, I pray that as we conclude this service, that you will have talked with our hearts, shown us exactly what our need is, encouraged us where we need it, Lord warned us where we need it as well. Thank you for what you've accomplished. May we make the right choices before we leave this, this afternoon now. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. I want to thank you for listening carefully to the message. And I, as I've said before, if you need to speak to me about a decision, please don't go until you can do that today. Just let me know very quickly, and we can uh, meet and, and have someone, if not myself, take you aside and show you how you can trust Christ. Don't forget the ushers will be at each door uh, that you can drop your tithe and offerings in. And uh, there are two meetings. Um, Right after our youth ministry directors, I need to meet with you in the kitchen very briefly. If you can meet me there, I'll be there as quickly as I can. And then deacons, I need to meet with you just after I get through with them uh, in the kitchen as well. So we'll have those two meetings there. And thank you for being here. Thank you for being here for our 48th anniversary and for our graduates. Praise the Lord for each one of them. God bless you all. You are dismissed.